All right, it is 2 p.m. So we can go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to another edition of Bring a Hacker to Web Day, um, our day in the life series where we hang out with people who are doing various stages of amazing, amazing in um, cybersecurity space. Um, and we talk to them about how they got there and uh, what their plans are for world, world domination. So I'm very excited today. Um, our guest is Katora Williams, um, soon to be Dr. Katora Williams, but right yes. as of right now, just a, a doctoral candidate, I understand. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, uh, you know, how, how did you get here? Uh, oh, well. so that's the, a really funny story how I got here. Um, so I am a doctoral candidate at Temple University um, in the Department of Criminal Justice, and I study a couple of things, but with regard to this, I do a lot of research in the um, social engineering um, space, and my dissertation is actually on lateral surveillance. So like my own independent work is, is on privacy and surveillance. Um, but <laughs> I got here because I used to be a psych major years ago, and um, like my undergrad is in psychology, and I was, before I came to Temple for my criminal, for my degree in criminal justice, I was actually in a clinical psychology doctorate program. And I was like very into personality disorders and liars and manipulators. And so oh I was gosh. interested in it, in it from the psych end. And then I said, oh, you know, I could do this from two different dimensions. And so I decided to transfer out of there into a criminal justice program. Um, and someone recommended me to Dr. Ancho Rege, who is the um, cybersecurity professor in the department. And me and her talked and she was like, oh, so you have psych skills and I study social engineering, we should work. And so that's kind of how I got here. That's amazing. Can you, can you still hear me? I yeah. changed my microphone. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, that's absolutely amazing for two reasons. Okay. Number one is because uh, Dr. Reggae is one of my favorite people. She's so amazing. Um, and uh, number two, um, I've actually been watching this show recently um, called Lie to Me. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite shows. That was actually what made me start um, thinking about uh, going in this direction. Okay, like his, that's, that's his amazing. understanding or the show's premise about emotional intelligence and like facial cues. So I've always been like quietly obsessed with like serial killers and like the deranged. Mm -hmm. um, but it was it was lied to me that was like, OK, I'm going to make a career out of this. <laughs> yeah, that's that that's so dope. Like I, I've seen it before. I actually made my husband when we first started uh like kind of dating. I'm like, we've got to watch this show. Um, So like and then I, I was like, you know what? I need something to kind of like chill out. Um, because we're getting ready for um uh, our DEF CON stuff. So I was like, I'm gonna watch, you know, lie to me again. Um, and it's been like so like I, I absolutely love the show and like the whole premise. So like I'll ask my husband these days, like I'll be like, you know, hey, you know, what are we eating for dinner? And then he'll just like start twitching so, like a shoulder or something, or <laughs> like start scratching his face up so that I'll know that you know he's lying about whatever it is that he's he's he doesn't really want to eat. Um, but yeah, so. Social engineering, um, and you said lateral, um, lateral surveillance. So that's um, lateral surveillance. So what is what is lateral surveillance? Why do we so care lateral about that? surveillance is um, just peer to peer surveillance? It's how we surveil each other. Um, so it can be something like super simple. You click on somebody's Facebook page and you scroll through their pictures. Technically, you are engaging in lateral surveillance. It's relatively harmless, but it is still surveillance. Mm -hmm. On the more extreme end, you have like laws that are now being enacted that want you to report people for different health reasons and, and stuff like that. You see on social media, um, people are taking videos of people unsuspectingly and posting it on there for folks to laugh at or for, you know, the ability to go viral. Parents are using it as a form of discipline. So it's actually becoming very, very prevalent. And in my opinion, it's about to be sort of the next stage of the surveillance apparatus is like people are starting like 
law enforcement and, and government starting to get hit to us being outraged that they surveil us. So now they're really flipping it and having us do the work for them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that is having us do the work for them is lateral surveillance. Okay. Um, so like, I, I feel like I see this um, sometimes, like if somebody comes and visits, for example, like your LinkedIn page, you'll get a, a notification that says, um, yep. you know, hey, so-and-so viewed your profile or whatever. So, you know, that's the, you know, and they could just be checking it out for any number of reasons, but that lets me know that they've been, you know, in this case, surveilling, um, surveying mm -hmm. me. Um, and so why does this matter in, in like the greater sense? I mean, I know you talked about, you know, your interest in the psychology of like lying and people with multiple disorders, right? There, there's definitely a human side to this thing in cybersecurity that we do, right? H how does that all tie together? Like, why do we need um, social engineers? Why do we need people that are operating in this space? So a couple of things, right? One, I'm just really interested in like why people don't mind their business, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, flat, like flat out. That's how I got here. <laughs> why are you not minding your business? Like, you don't have to tape this person. Um, <laughs> but in terms of like tying it all together, right? Social engineering in some way is an invasion of your privacy, right? They are lying and manipulating you to get some information to either impersonate you, steal from you. Regardless, it is an invasion of your privacy. And so we need to be paying, be very cognizant of how much we put out about ourselves and other people that aids the social engineering. Mm -hmm. um, so that's like sort of where I'm I'm coming from um, with that is like we need to start going back to setting boundaries, right, and, and putting up walls around us if we want to protect ourselves and if we want to protect society, like at large. So in a perfect world that you see, um, we would not be sharing, you know, for example, these um tell me about your first car or tell me about your, yes. you know. <laughs> I, I cringe Last every meal. time. Yeah, I cringe every time I see those like Twitter threads where it's like, what would your name have been if you were a different gender? Or what color was your first car? And I'm like, do, do, do people not know that this is a security question? <laughs> and then you see, if you ever click on them, you see thousands of people that answer and they're like, oh, I'm so glad my mom didn't pick that name. Or, you, you know, like, uh, I miss my, you know, Pinto. Or, I mean, no one had, Pintos are so cool, but you get what I'm saying? Like, and it's like, you do know that this is a security question. Or like, which city did y'all live in 10 years ago? I've seen that one. I'm like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. That's like from? a question that comes up when you go to check your, your credit report. It like lists a whole bunch of like which of these cities is associated with you yep so um we have to like all of that is is surveillance in aid of social engineering mm -hmm. and i don't think i don't think that as a society we understand surveillance and privacy in a way that we should like we think surveillance as just cameras we don't think of it as pictures or posting things, right? Surveillance is only done by people seeking to harm you or by the government. We don't really pay attention to how much we play, play a role in it. Um, so I just want to kind of like flip the microscope a little bit and say, hey, mm -hmm. have you ever thought about how you aid in this apparatus operating? And if you think about it, do you still want to be a part of it? You know, like once you know that I'm doing this, you can start to make actions that or take actions that limit that behavior. You know what I mean? I, I know that for me, um, you know, there are certain uh, social media sites that, you know, I'm not personally a part of um, because once I found out about like some of the things that they're doing as far as uh, the uh, your privacy data um, mm -hmm. that I stopped being a part of those. Right. So you know, is the point of shining a light of like, you know, putting a microscope to these different areas is the point to get people to not, you know, participate in those social media, those social media activities, or is the point to get the, um, those organizations to stop collecting that data? Because I, I feel like a lot of these social media platforms exist solely for the data, for data right? collection. the yes. aggregation of 
you know, you've got millions of people who are talking about themselves and what they like to buy and what they like to do. And, you know, that data is very expensive to people who are trying to sell us things. Yeah. Um, I completely agree with you. I think that there are some aspects of social media that exist solely to make you a commodity, right? To buy and sell you um, or buy and sell your data, I should say. I don't know that just like by human nature and the way that technology has invaded our lives that we'll ever be at a point where we can say, please stop using this platform, right? Look at how many, how many breaches of trust, privacy Facebook has committed and how many millions of people still use that platform. <laughs> right? Like how and 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 now when you look at some of the stuff that's coming out about Instagram, right? And how they are specifically targeting young girls about their body image and stuff like that. Meanwhile, you still you still have people that post on it. So I don't think we'll ever get folks to not in, engage with these platforms. My goal is to try and get you to engage more thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. Some things are just not meant for public consumption. Some things are not meant for social media. Please put it in your group chat. Call your friend and talk about it if you have to. The <laughs> whole world. Because that's literally what, when you put it on social media, that's literally what's happening is the whole world is about to see this. Um, and, and locking your profile does not technically mean that the whole world won't see it. All you got to do is take a little screenshot and then repost it and it's out. You know what I mean? So... I just want people to think for a second before they um, before they post things. And that's actually like, um, just to do like a quick little pivot real quick, that's actually what my dissertation is about. I'm actually looking at the thought process that people go through when they take a photo of somebody unsuspectingly. So you see mm -hmm. somebody in, in an outfit that you don't like at the airport or that you think is embarrassing. Walk me through that process that you take their photo and then post it on social media. What are you mm -hmm. thinking throughout this whole process? Because why didn't you just mind your business? Like, why did you feel like that they needed to be posted publicly for the world to have a comment on? So, so um, I, I want to play devil's advocate and just, uh, just, just for something that's going on right now in the world. Um, so I hopped on uh, Twitter, minding other people's business uh, yesterday, <laughs> like I normally do. Um, Me too. And there were um, a picture of a gentleman like from like maybe waist down and he's got on some shorts and you know, like you can see that he's got what's alleged to be uh, monkey pox on his legs right um, and the picture was a part of a um, uh, a thread because the doctor was on the train with him or whatever um, and he's like hey you've got monkey pox why, why are you not at home you know isolating and his doctor was like you know I just have to wear a mask and other than that like I'm good to go go out um, so when we're thinking about things like kind of like from a public health perspective right is that not informational because there are probably people who are out here who think that you know you can only get um, monkeypox if you're fall into a certain classification of people, right? right. Um, so as a public health service, like letting people know like, hey, that's not the case, right? Does that not um, does that not help? Or are you saying like, hey, is there another way to get this information out? Like, because a lot of these things, when they go viral, you know, that whole going viral is just exposure to a whole lot of different people, right? So yeah. is it doing a public health service you know is this like the same as like Smokey the Bear back in you know in my days or <laughs> right I mean so there's a fine line for everything right there's always some some things that cross cross the line I feel like for, for public health reasons yeah perhaps we should engage in surveillance right there are things that you're as parents we do to you know you check your kid's phone or whatever to make sure everything's safe right those are are well within the boundaries I believe mm -hmm. of quote unquote surveillance. Um, so I don't I don't necessarily see anything wrong with it, especially if the doctor got the man's permission, like, hey, can I post this photo just as like a public service announcement to everybody to say like, hey, monkeypox might show up like this, or it might look like that. Like, if you have these things, go see a doctor, isolate. That's perfectly fine. For me, I'm talking about like blatant invasions of privacy, mm -hmm. um, where it's like, 
this doesn't have to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and so like one of the examples that I used in my presentation was, um, I don't know if you remember, like years back, um, Monique was posting photos, like Monique was mad about us going outside in bonnets. And she kept posting photos of women outside in their bonnets. Mm -hmm. At the same time she was mad about the bonnets, she posted a, a picture of a woman in the airport mm -hmm. and saying, you know, if this is your best, then fine, that let that be your best. But if you if it's not your best, then do better. That woman had no clue that her photo was on Monique's profile. Mm. Because if you look at the photo, the picture is taken from behind. Mm -hmm. So why would you like? I'm I'm looking more at the the shaming mm -hmm. aspect of it. Um, like I said, there are aspects of this that I completely accept that we have to engage in for public health, even some aspects of public safety. But I think that as like at large, with the aid of social media, we've crossed the line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I, I, I want to ask you uh, about one specific example, and then um, I, I want to pivot into like how this fits into like the overall cybersecurity, um, you know, like umbrella. Um, those uh, viral things where they're like, you know, let me show you five generations of my family and it'll be like, hey, here's the kid and the kid's name is, you know, whatever. And then here's their father and then here's their whatever right you know to participate in that they're saying like hey what's your maternal you know grandmother's name well i know that now because you know you just yep. posted her you know that um i think it has a value because it's like you know it's good to see you know hey six generations of the family and they're still alive and kicking you know but at the same time like that's the type of leakage that you are are talking about right yes that and that's the kind of stuff that hackers love you know, because if you think about all of the pieces that come together, you take that photo of all the generations of your family, right? or you do like the TikTok of it, depending on where you do it, if you're outside, now I can OSINT and figure out where you are, right? If you got the house number in the background, or I can, you know, now we can try and figure out where you are, depending on the name of your profile, if you have your first and your last name or your real name, <laughs> attached to these profiles and you're putting your family members names above them in their ages mm. well I can count so I can kind birth of run day, these birth years, years right mm -hmm. and if you say this is your child I might assume that this is the same last name mm -hmm. and I've now gotten depending on where you've posted this picture and I've done some OSA I now have the geographic location I might can go do some things with it. Look, or or it's Virgo season. Well, if it's Virgo season, that means that you know it's you in this your birthday is in one of these two months. 30 days, right? right? It'll be 60 <laughs> days. Exactly. And I just I don't think that people are aware of how much we put out about ourselves and other people. And I don't think because most people don't know what social engineering is, they don't really understand it, right? They think hacking and they think it's somebody sitting in the basement just typing all day. And that's not what the hacker looks like anymore. Yeah, um, and that's that, that's what I wanted. To, that was the next topic I wanted to talk about. Um, when we think about hackers, a lot of people say, well, hey, if they're not like, you know, keyboards down, like they're not, you know, sitting here like, you know, typing away frantically on a, on a, on a keyboard, then they're not really um, hackers, but there are, you know, an entire subset of people who are non-technical, who yes. have very thriving careers in uh, cybersecurity, who may never touch a keyboard, you know, yep. in the way that we, you know, assume that hackers do, right? Yes. So can you talk a little bit about what that looks like? Um, and I'm thinking specifically about like, when we're talking about like doing a penetration test or, and that that reconnaissance phase that, you know, OSINT, like you said, that social engineering piece, like how does that fit into I mean, like what we think of hacker activities? So, so from the social engineering perspective, right? There are a whole bunch of things. We all get those like silly emails that are clearly scams, right? But then there are some of them that come across and I'm like, oh, this one, wait a minute. You know, you got to do where the, 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 the thing that was signal that this is not legitimate is super small, right? It's a, a capital, a capital um, I next to an L, right? <laughs> like super small that you, you would overlook. Um, and so we have, so like, there are a whole bunch of, so there's that the phishing component, right? Where phishers are getting much, much better at sending out these emails. 
um, mm-hmm. and getting you to click on them. There's dishing, which is just over the phone. You know what I mean? People can call up to a business and act like they are an inquiring customer and try and get information. And because you, you know, other person on the line are trained to give out good customer service, you get to start answering their questions. And next mm-hmm. thing you know, they got they got what they need to come up with an identity to come in and collect some data or break into a system or something like that. So the concept of hacking and the way hacking looks is, has completely shifted and you really only need a phone at this point. <laughs> mm-hmm. You just need a phone. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Just just how um, the uh, social engineering, I guess, fits into like the, the physical penetration tests. Like, so not the, like, I'm trying to break into your systems, but the, I'm testing, like, for example, like your physical, like, can people get in? Are you- Can people just you know, walk in the door if, if you're going to check my badge? And so all of that stuff, is, is like you said, it's all, it's all recon. It's, it's how social engineers figure out whether this is a suitable target for them to go after and what the strategy is that they need to, 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 to um, implement in order to attack you or your business, right? Um, and there, there's just a lot, right? Shoulder surfing, looking over somebody's shoulder and let me see what you're typing real fast or what you're putting in so that way I can you know, go in and instill your identity, right? Social engineering has has really evolved how cyber attacks take place mm-hmm. and how hacking takes place. And it's really sad that the world doesn't want to kind of understand it and, ad- and adapt to it because we really, really need to understand the role that the human plays and executing these things. And it's not just the human on the keyboard, it's literally your daily activities and how Mm -hmm. they play a role in in being hacked or being penetrated in some capacity. Um, But social engineering is super, super important to the recon phase and developing what your strategy is gonna be to um, attacking some target of, of some sort. And if we can get folks to really acknowledge and understand that part, then we can start preventing cybersecurity or preventing cyber attacks, I should say, and like really increasing cybersecurity awareness. But it's just- Yeah, I think the the thing that kind of gets people is when we teach people about um, social engineering, just from an educational perspective, right? Um, we generally tell them to spot like things like, you know, obvious spelling issues, yes. obvious grammar issues, right? But, you know, when you look at uh, things like phishing or vishing or swishing or whatever, from the human perspective, right? Um, you could, it's possible that you not have any spelling grammars and you not have any whatever. Um, I know my best friend sent me um, a copy of a, a text message that she got that was like, hey, um, we weren't able to deliver your UPS package. Yes. Um, click here to confirm, right? And then of course, if you click there, you know, and there's no spelling or grammar or any issues in right. it. But if you click there, you know, it's going to like, hey, what's your address? You know, what's your, you know, it's going to start asking you for information. Oh, you have to log in to do this, right? Yeah, and then they're sending going to want you, you to, to a malicious website that is essentially going to uh, take your information, probably sell it on the dark web or use that information in furtherance of getting more information on you to steal your identity or take some med- money out of your bank account, all of these things. Um, and I, I just, I don't know, I don't know how to get folks to like adapt and like understand what's happening here. Like, um, you can run as mil- a million ad campaigns. No one is ever going to not make their password password. <laughs> <laughs> like, I feel like that is the one thing that is. I added one, two, three. It's, it's secure now. <laughs> yes. Right. Or I put a capital P instead of a lowercase P. Like, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Um. And so like with, with working with Dr. Reggae, we do a lot of um, work on cybersecurity education, specifically teaching folks about social engineering, sending them out in the field to do social engineering, or that's what she does in her class, I should say. Um, send them out in the field to do social engineering tactics on other people and then tell them that you just social engineered them. And so that they can increase their awareness. And I promise you like right after it's over, they go right back and do the same thing. <laughs> 
this is true because I, I think that people don't um, realize I've actually seen some of the videos that, uh, you know, for mm -hmm. the people submit as a part of like the, I think it's their final project for her, you know, where they're like doing a social media, uh, not a social, a social engineering um, uh, activity. And then um, people don't understand like why that matters. Right. Yeah. yeah. You you're like, you know, hey, um, how's your mom? What's your name again? You know, <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, my mom's name is Susan. And then it's like, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, how's Susan? I haven't seen her in such a long time. Remember we met at that, you know, place, um, you know, near where you grew up. Um, yes. What was that, that building? Like, you know, and then it'll be like, well, well, why does that matter? You know, because again, people can use this information um, to try to, you know, break into a lot of different places because this is how people secure their systems is through, you know, for example, security questions or, exactly. you know, like password reset, like, you know, so that you don't have to actually reach out to a person, right? So what do you say to the people who say like, hey, you know, everybody's already breached my data, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can't take this like, I'm throwing my hands in the air approach to this, right? Because there's always more data to be gathered. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, there's always more. And I think that even if someone already, even if the, the thought is there, like, well, there's no point in investing in cybersecurity and learning the, the mindset of a hacker because I've already been hacked. It's like, but don't you want to prevent the next person from being hacked? Like, do you not have this investment in the greater good in some capacity? You want to protect your kids' data? <laughs> or, you, or your grandma's data, like you have somebody that you care about who hasn't been hacked and you don't want them to experience that. So don't you want to protect them from that and, and you know, learn the tools that you need to know to, to do so? Um, so I, I don't want people to take like this nihilistic approach and being like, or, you know, we can't, the, the, the hacking community has just outsmarted us and we'll never be able to get one up on them. Like, that's not the case. Um, will hackers always exist? Will data breaches always happen? Yes. But what we can do is get smarter on our end to make the hackers have to work a whole lot harder. And right mm -hmm. now we are just refusing to get smarter. And we are using, we are allowing social media to be a tool, another tool in the hackers arsenal to go in and steal our data by willingly posting so much information about ourselves and our kids. Like kids have Instagram pages now. Why? <laughs> so now hackers are about to have all their data from birth up until five or, or however, you know what I mean? Because you're willingly putting it out there now. So my thought is that we need to help kind of um, shift the orientation of society to a more safe safety-based like start defending yourself against this by knowing how hackers work so that way mm -hmm. when you go to try it you know best defense is an effective offense right so as soon as they go to try it you right there like I, I nope find another approach but right now we're just we're just not taking the I, I find another approach <laughs> we're not there yet we're not ready yeah yeah we're not ready um we're, we're still very much living in la la land where everything we post online it's just, it's only online and it never makes its way anywhere else. So um, we are actually going to see a little bit more of you. Um, uh, you were talking about hackers and I was like, oh yeah, we're, we're doing um, our Girls Hack Village at DEF CON coming up and you're going to be talking about your, um, your research there. So I guess without, you know, giving us any spoilers, what is, what is that going to look like? What do, what do you, um, what is the takeaway I think from so, you know, the research that you're doing? Um, so my DEF CON presentation actually is not on my research. Um, I was uh, very excited to, to deviate away from, from talking about my research for one second. Um, the DEF CON presentation is actually going to be about the experience of studying cybersecurity in grad school as a Black woman. Mm -hmm. um, so like we spent a lot of time talking about how like the tech industry is a boys club and specifically like a white male dominated industry. Mm -hmm. We never really talk about what it's like to be a researcher. Mm. Um, so I want to I want to give folks um, that that perspective because uh, there's there's some things we need some kinks we need to work out on that end too. <laughs> if we if we really want to have um, tech that is ethical, that is inclusive, we gotta start letting folks in. And right now, higher ed is still very much 
doing a lot of things to keep us out and that pushing us out is having a whole lot of collateral consequences I believe so I want to talk about that's what I'll be talking about okay so like the there's not just gatekeeping for example in industry which are keeping you know people of color women from getting into cybersecurity. like even if we take it back a level and start looking at you know the leader stages of like the education system right you know there's still gatekeeping that's going there they're preventing us from being able to get in you know what is it like grad school programs, master's right. programs, PhD programs, um, that would prevent us from, you know, being able to get higher education, to be able to speak about, you know, cybersecurity from a a, a, a doctorate perspective, you know, like right. to be able to study. And then there are also like discipline specific. So I'm in, I'm a criminal justice major. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say this flat out, Criminal justice does not have a lot of investment in cybersecurity. Uh, they think that that is that's the computer science guys' res- job to mm-hmm. to handle, right? Um, and within my department, I've done plenty of presentations. None of the faculty outside of Dr. Reggae knows what I'm talking about. Mm. So, like sometimes they don't even bother to show up because they don't know what I'm talking about. Like, there's no investment in understanding it from different perspectives which is a whole nother layer of of the gatekeeping, right? Um, That's not a valued area of research here. So we're not going to really invest resources into helping you get your work out. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole bunch of- uh, So they don't don't see the tie. They're like, hey, this is something that's criminal justice. It has nothing to do with me and math or has nothing to do with me in science or- If it's not cops, courts, or flat out crime, like violence, then they're not really interested. Um, and, and I see someone just put in the comments about ethics and cybersecurity. Um, yes, they, uh, they, without letting other people, so let me just finish that. If it's not cops, courts, or crime, like violence, then criminal justice is a really, there are some people that, that like, will in the field that do study it and do value it, but it's still considered very, very niche. The level of support is not really there. It's, it's very insulated. Those of us who know, know, and we all support each other, but as a field, like a writ large, criminal, the field of criminal justice is like, no, that's that computer science or whatever, handle it. And the ripple effect is that when you don't have criminal justice professionals, when you don't have sociologists, when you don't have anthropologists, all these people that study how people, Human. psychologists, when you start to study people and cultures and all of that, then you lose the moral part of it. Now you're starting to, now you're, you have a field that is inundated with people whose only goal is to make the machine work smarter. They don't care about whether what they're doing is harmful to society. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually had a conversation with someone in this space years and years ago. I was at a conference out of the country, and and their their thought was like, if I sell a, if I develop a strategy a, a tech program that kills people, as long as it's effective, I did my job. <laughs> like what happens after that, you know, whoever buys it and how they choose to use it is out of my control. All my job is is to make this program effective. And I was like, well. This is dangerous. And I don't want to be like, well, like, you know, this is terrible not uh, to get on like my soapbox. But like I, one of the things that I will always like, you know, hop on the soapbox for is the impact of, you know, to humans of algorithms. Right. We have people who are um, basically defining this. You know, we have a white male cybersecurity, white male researchers, like as you said, because they're mm-hmm. gatekeeping. We don't have a lot of black people who are in the space, right? And then these algorithms are developed, and these algorithms are doing things like deciding, you know, how long somebody is, you know, how likely they're going to be to uh, go back re-offend. to jail or to yep. to reoffend, or how likely they are to whatever, or like whether or not they deserve to have a kidney because of, you know, X, Y, and Z, right? And a lot of these systems, um, when we're talking about like machine learning. Um, are biased in the same way that the people who develop them by are biased, right? And then when you don't look at the 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 aspect of you know like how is this impacting humans, right? And you're just looking at it like from hey, I have an algorithm and it's doing you know the thing. What we right? programmed it to do? 
I, I, I've done what I was supposed to do, right? There's nothing else to consider, right? You, you don't look at the fact that, you know, the algorithm on, on average, you know, says that Black people are more likely to reoffend just because of the data that has always gotten, which is, you know, police systems that are, you know, targeting African-Americans okay. primarily. So it, it's like, we're, we're telling it like, hey, you're definitely going to want vanilla. And then when the system says like, hey, you want vanilla, then we're like, yes, the system's doing what it's supposed to do, right? As right. opposed to having them be, you know, taking a look at them from the the human aspect of, you know, what is this, where is the bias? Where can this go wrong, right? And I, I think that people don't think about that in ter- when they're thinking about cybersecurity. They're just thinking about like, hey, you know, I need to be able to hack, right? But they're not thinking about things like, that are under the umbrella mm-hmm. when we're talking about things like ethics or what the impact is to society for, you know, us not having diversity in cybersecurity, you know, for us not having, you know, researchers who say, hey, I think that this is biased, you know, this is skewing the data in a way that's not, that's harmful, you know, and I, I people don't care about that. They don't think about that, you know. No, not at all. And I, I will never forget that conversation because I was like, whoa, you can't say that. <laughs> like that was my first thought was like, you can't have that approach. And that was my first realization that the tech side does not have ethics uh, at all. And, and what I've learned is that very few of them are taught ethics um, in general. And so it's all about making things effective or making them smarter and there's no discussion about like whether we should even make this in the first place (laughs) or like like let's start there we don't screw the smarter part do we even need to do this Um, yeah like like facial recognition um uh, all the studies that i've seen for facial recognition say that the people who end up on the um uh like the negative end of the scale um, are, you know, Black women, because it, it has a harder time reading our face as opposed to someone else, right? Well, why does that matter? Because, like, they use these systems for, like, you know, hey, are you traveling? Are you doing this? Are you, you know, whatever? Like, if there, something happens and they're like, well, this is the, the face of the person who did it. Well, all of your faces look alike. There's, you know, a ridiculous, exactly. you know, 40% error rate for Black women. You know, that means that more, there's a 40% chance that we're going to end up in jail, even though we didn't do it, you know, because they can't tell my face from yours, you know, for example. Right. right. And then on on the to flip it back to the, the privacy and the surveillance part is how much of a role do we want to play? Right. Because now you put it on social media, it's, it's, it's sold. It's a commodity now. Right. How much mm-hmm. of this do we want to play? How much of a role do we want to play in making this kind of software smarter? Right. I just we were talking about people who have their children. You are going to create a timeline of your child's face maturing (laughs) right Right? how much of this do you want Facebook or Meta to have access to which can then sell it to Palantar Peter Thiel's company which can then put it out to all these police databases and now we've just helped make facial recognition software smarter Mm -hmm. without even intentionally meaning to do so or, you know, we, we see, you know, what aging looks like in a black male, right? Um, we, this person committed this crime 10 years ago. What should they look like based off of, you know, all these pictures that we now see, you know, of black men, you know, through, through social media? What does that person look like at this point, you know? And it's, people, people probably don't think about things so that, like that. Um, they probably don't also, also think about the fact that, like, if their kids' data gets taken you know a lot of people will like for example lock down their own credit reports but not their kids right and if their kids data gets stolen they won't find out about it until they go to pull their credit report what 10 years 15 years later you know or whatever it is yeah when they go to get their first car and they go get their first loan right um and and then all of a sudden you're like well actually you are you defaulted on such and such and such and you're like wait a minute i i'm i was 12 at the time how did i default on something um but that's the way that's sort of the the way the game's going and um we're just not we're not prepared <laughs> and we we can't get prepared as long as we are not one incorporating ethics but also to bring a whole bunch of different voices different perspectives to the table and right now um the the black woman's perspective is not being hurt. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the black perspective across the table, but I can't speak for the role of a black man, right? I can only speak for, for black women. And from where I'm sitting, I don't feel like my voice is at that table. 
my mm-hmm. voice isn't isn't in there um and so I want to take an opportunity to like really shout like hey I'm not saying grad school is for everybody it's a whole bunch of nonsense that goes on in there but if you if you want a different approach to cybersecurity, there is the researcher route and anything that you produce from that perspective as a black woman is valuable because there's no there's no voice there and the right there's not a lot are of there, black. yeah the few yeah. Is out, like we not shout we whisper and we need to shout um and so, so i'm all about bringing more folks in I, I agree completely because you don't see a lot of um, researchers that are Black for a lot of the reasons that you said, you know, in order for people to get respected in the field, they have to go and get their PhD, you know, but then there's gatekeeping, which are preventing uh, you from seeing people of color in there, you know, which means all of the leading voices, all of the, you know, research that's being produced are all going to be from, you know, white men, because those are the only people who ha- have uh, been allowed to get to the point where their their voice can be respected in the field. So what you, your criminal justice and like I said, people don't typically assume that, you know, criminal justice and cybersecurity, you know, have a role or, or have a marriage or so what are some of the job prospects for you? Like, you know, what what does the job market look like once you are, you know, Dr. Williams uh, next year? Well, I'm mean, honest, I really don't know. Um, oh, <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> Um, I have no clue. So I'm in the, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going the industry route or the education or the, you know, big university route. Um, mm-hmm. a part so, of but those is, are still the options. You could be a professor yeah, or, I could go to, college. or I could go government. Right. Um, one thing I'm not interested in doing, like me personally is I'm not interested in doing anything law enforcement related. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so that's, that's out of the cards for me. So, um, I would love to go academia just to like help radicalize the youth, like, come on, like, you know, uh, <laughs> but. So, so like on its face, right? Does it, it, it sounds crazy that you are getting a degree in criminal justice, but you don't want to go in what people assume people do for criminal justice, which is, you know, law no, enforcement no, no. agencies. Nah. So what, what else is that? You said that you could be a professor. You can, um, who else? needs us uh, cybersecurity researchers or who, who else needs criminal justice researchers so um just i mean all these all these companies big companies are always hiring for privacy analysts and stuff like that right you want your mm-hmm. data you want your data protected when you go to order them sneakers then nike needs a privacy analyst right mm. <laughs> um so so there's that um there are also like big watchdog groups that are not um that are not like tech affiliated or academia affiliated, but they are researchers that do things. Um, I, I, the organization's name is escaping my mind, but it's one in, I believe, Toronto. Mm-hmm. And they've been, they are, uh, have been attached to some really big stories about um, government surveilling its citizens or government surveilling its journalists. And these are a group of academics and tech folks with a variety of skills that come together and they put out reports about, yes, the government is surveilling this and this in this journal. This is how we got to this conclusion. Here's all the data and the evidence. Now, what y'all do with it? We told y'all what's happening. You know, how you feel about it is different. So there's a whole Mm -hmm. bunch of um, different options that you could take. Um, I think... I don't know where, me personally, I don't know where I'm going to end up, but businesses need surveillance and cybersecurity and privacy mm-hmm. analysts, government needs you, law enforcement needs you, academia 1 million percent needs you, um, nonprofits need you. Um, if you want to volunteer in the community, they need you, right? We can't get uh, smarter about protecting our data if there's nobody out there that's talking to us right you could in your free time you could run workshops on cybersecurity and privacy for the elderly Mm -hmm. (laughs) or for the youth right teach them about social engineering so that way they grow up with this skill set so they've been protecting themselves for as long as they can remember so protecting themselves is second nature a whole bunch Mm -hmm. of things you can do um i'm just not sure what i'm going to wind up doing (laughs) okay (laughs) <laughs> Look, that might impact my my final question for you, but we'll we'll get there when we get there. Um, so when we're talking about um researching um and what it is to look like, did you have to know 
what you wanted to research when you came in or what does, what does that look like when you're saying like, hey, this is what I want to focus on as far as picking a problem? So so when I came in um, and so I, earlier in the conversation, I said that I do a couple of different things. My primary focus when I came in was um, studying girls in the hood. I was very interested in the development of street smarts and mm-hmm. how black girls used it to navigate the community. And then I started thinking about, okay, well, how does street smarts translate digitally, right? Is there a physical in the neighborhood street smarts and then a tech street smarts? Mm. Um, And so then I got there and then I got with, I got introduced to Dr. Reggae. I got that referral to her. We started talking. She figured out, you know, my skill set. And she was like, oh, we we work perfect together. Um, And in the midst of talking to her, I happened to slip out that I'm like, oh, why? I'm not a conspiracy theorist. That's not the right word. But like, I am like very afraid of like data breaches. And um, I'm big on like, why does nobody care about privacy? Why is like the youth don't talk about privacy? They don't care about privacy. Um, they just post stuff and she was like, well, why don't you just do this? And like no one talks about privacy and surveillance with the the type of concern that you have. At least nobody that I talked about, like, why don't you make this your thing? And I was like, oh, yeah, I, guess, I mean, I guess I could, you know, make my strange habits at home and like my ramblings about why you are letting Alexa in your house is a bad thing. Like, why do you want this microphone in your house is, is really bad. Um, you know, those are the rants that I share with my husband on the couch. And she's acting like, I guess I could make a career out of this. Like <laughs> maybe people care about, about these things. And, and so that's how, that's kind of how that, that came together. So I came in wanting to do something completely different. I actually do still work in that space. Like I have public, um, I have papers that are going out for publication in that space too. And then I also do the surveillance, social engineering, privacy stuff. So you can do, if, if anybody's considering higher education, you don't have to have like tunnel vision on mm-hmm. one thing. So when you're talking about um, uh, young girls having street smarts, right? We're talking about them adapting to be able to survive, right? And yes. you you were trying to see what, what that looks like for people. Are they using those same kinds of like, how do I survive and protect myself uh, instincts, but on in a digital space? Yeah, so that was supposed to be what my original dissertation was, but there was a whole bunch of, of things that kind of impeded me from pulling that off. <laughs> and, and and was part of that that people did not feel the uh, the need to take a look into that, to the research, to, because it was for specifically Black women, or was it because... No, um, it was just me feeling like logistically I wouldn't be able to do it and that I wanted to hold on to it for like my larger big career agenda like let me build my name off of this as opposed to like I just need to graduate (laughs) um so like I'm I'm laying the foundation for that larger question like twofold I got the privacy and surveillance stuff over here so I'm learning how folks um, engage in the decision, how folks go about the decision-making process to engage in lateral surveillance. And then I'm getting what people consider the definition of street smarts and how parents instill street smarts in their children on the other side. So I have two kind of like data banks Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, and like collections of papers happening. And then at some point they will merge together and maybe in a few years, you'll talk to me about like, I remember when you was on here and you were saying you was going to do this and now you did it. Um, <laughs> fingers crossed. I can't wait. <laughs> fingers crossed. Don't steal my idea, whoever, if anybody's watching this, or at least collaborate with me on it, okay? <laughs> and, and that's a problem. You have to worry about uh, people still yeah. doing things with your research. Um, I, I, I feel like um, there is a big part of you being able to graduate um, as a graduate student, um, you being able to get to where you need to get done with your like for example your not just your advisors but like the people who are on what is it the board um the committee the committee for you um who have the ability to block what it is that you're doing right yes so 
when you're doing your PhD program, what are some of the things um, you talked about how hard it is for uh, a, a black woman in the space, a lot of the gatekeeping, gatekeeping. Do you have any, um, I guess, advice for people who are interested in getting into a graduate program, what they should maybe be on the lookout for questions that they should ask to kind of like avoid some of the pitfalls that you've had to experience just through trial and error? Um, wow, that's like, a that's a big, big question. Um, one thing that I will say is be firm in knowing that your your idea, your concept, whatever you want to study is is, is valuable. Um, when I first walked in there and said I wanted to study street smarts, no one, no one knew what I was talking about. And mm-hmm. I was like, is like this, I'm not like everybody I know has street smarts. I've been hearing this phrase all my life, right? Uh, how do you not know? No one knew what I was talking about. And so mm-hmm. I got a lot of flack about why don't you try something different? Why don't mm-hmm. you frame it differently? And I was like, no, I'm not putting a different label on it. It's street smarts. If you ask anybody who has it, do they have street smarts? They know exactly what you're talking about. So just but because you don't understand it's a cultural it, thing, right? It's a, it, and I, I did not necessarily realize that it was a cultural thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so it's a cultural thing. And um, you have to, I had to really fight to get them to, to recognize that this was a valuable concept. And this is something that the field of criminal justice should care about. And this is something that is worth researching. Um, so I would say for anybody who's considering going through this, if you have an idea, if you have a belief about something that you wanna pursue, pursue it. Um, because your voice is still important in the discussion. Right. There's a there's a spin on it that you're going to put that hasn't been looked at. And even if it has, it's probably old and it needs to be re-questioned. Right. We've evolved. (laughs) There's a whole bunch of things that have happened in society that have impacted thought processes. So even if somebody wrote about it in the 70s, it's 2022. Things have changed. Right. Write about it again. Um, and just just be confident in, in your abilities and in your um, in your idea. They're going to try and stop you from doing it because, like I said, if it's not courts, crime, or violence, they don't know anything. If it's not um, courts, police, or violence, they don't they don't value it. Um, but you have to know that what you have is valuable, and you might have to do. You might have to reach out to people for mentorship on your own. It might require you to do some extra leg work on your own. You might not feel as supported in your institution, which is a whole nother issue that I'll talk about at Black Girls Hack um, at the village. Um, but don't let them discourage you. It's valuable. Do it. <laughs> like just do it. Um, don't. don't see me Nike, but that's the thing. Just like just do it. <laughs> So um, if you had to do it all over again, would you uh, would you still be going through your PhD program? Depends on which day it is. Um, <laughs> I will, I'm going to be honest. There were a lot of times where I was like, I am not doing this. I'm dropping out. This is my last semester. I'm dropping out. I'm not doing this anymore. This is not worth it. I'm not doing it anymore. And then something good will happen. I'm like, oh, I see all that work paid off. So it really, it really, really depends on what day it is. Um, but I think for since my one of my like big uh, big goals in life is to help sort of dismantle the, the surveillance apparatus in this country, this mm-hmm. is probably the right way to go about it. So, yeah. Probably. OK, well, that that ties in very well to my my last question. <clears throat> and then we'll open it up to other folks to see if they've got any questions, which is what is your world domination plan? You know, which is like what are you going, what do you, where do you see yourself? Like, how will you know that you have achieved success, that you've left an impact on society? You know, what does that look like for you? You know, so for some people that's, I want to be a CISO, or for some people that's, you know, I want to do this, you know, what does that for you look like? I can expand the conversation on surveillance in any way, where we are starting to think more carefully about our decisions, and what we want, what we deem as acceptable and non-acceptable surveillance, then I feel like as long as my name is in that conversation somewhere, then I feel like I did a good job. If I can just bring down the whole surveillance apparatus that we're kind of under, then like, thank you. Like Nobel Peace Prize me, the whole shebang. Um, (laughs) That'd be great. 
But if if my name is just in the conversation about how we view and discuss surveillance from a different perspective, then I'm fine. Okay, that's dope. All right, uh, so I'll open it up to the folks that are here. Um, do you have any questions for our guests? And I should probably go and check and see if YouTube has any. You can type them in the chat or... Sorry. Um, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. <laughs> um, all right, well, if no one has any questions, um, how can they find you on uh, Hi. socials? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, what advice would you give to somebody that is still like venture and into cybersecurity. Um currently I, I have a I have a um I have a bachelor's in um national security and like a little bit I have a little um knowledge on cybersecurity but my career kind of took like a little turn. I joined the army but I branch a different um MOS. I'm a I'm in combat arms as a black woman but I'm willing I'm looking in the future next year or so to um, venture back into cyber. Um what advice would you give to people that are like still kind of like going into cyber, still like learning, what platform would you recommend? Like stuff like that to stay up so, to date with news. So I don't um like like I said earlier, I don't do like the big tech stuff. I'm kind of like mm -hmm. on the periphery of it. Yeah, um, but I would I would totally say um, look into social engineering. Um, okay. It is 100% needed. Like we need folks who understand social engineering. If you can understand social engineering, you are going to be able to get a job um, okay. in tech um, because tech is bigger than codes. Like it's bigger than zeros and ones. Um, hmm. and, and cybersecurity is bigger than zeros and ones and, and everything. And the way to stop intrusions is to know how to, is to cut them off at the recon stage. And that's where, um, that's where social engineering comes from. So the only thing I can speak to um, is to just say, cause that's the only thing I really know how to do in terms of like the larger tech space is to say, look into social engineering, understand human behavior, understand how humans operate. Um, if you can do that, then you are super valuable to the cybersecurity community. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, I'll definitely mm -hmm. do that, thank you. And I think right. we had another- we have another yeah, I see one in the chat that says, regarding surveillance, what would you say, what would you advise, what advice would you give to influencers, especially those who do daily vlogs? Um, so, so for the vloggers and the influencers, this is like, um, they're they're such an interesting, an interesting bunch. Like, if, I would love to do like a whole separate study with just the vloggers, um, and like the the family, like YouTubers, just because it's like, do you know how much of your life you share? Um, <laughs> What I would say is don't show too much of yourself, right? No one needs to see your whole apartment or, um, you know, like, don't take me on the walk that you, your, your daily walk that you do. Don't, don't bring the camera and like the selfie stick, like set some boundaries, set some limits. When you want to film, kind of filmed in like a nondescript place, right? Uh, or kind of film, I should say, in like a nondescript place. There are things you can do to protect yourself while still being um, profitable in that industry. And semi-open um, about, you know, who you are. Like, hey, this is what I do. Yes. But you do it safely. Do it safely. Put some boundaries in place. Do some, have some things that you want only people in your life to know about you. Um, and And that's a really good way of sort of protecting your your privacy and your anonymity and your identity, right? You can still be an influencer and take pictures, like if it's Instagram, for example, and take pictures in like Fashion Nova or Pretty Little Things standing in front of a white wall, right? Like you can do it. I'm only saying that because that's the, the one that's like at the top of my mind. But and be standing in front of a white wall instead of giving me the layout of the building that you live in or standing in front of like the one two three for your address <laughs> exactly like you're there are ways everybody doesn't need to see the car that you just got right especially if the front license plate is related to the dealer that you bought it from because <laughs> OSINT 
we can figure out where you are, right? So you have to be very, just be really cognizant of how much information you're including in those photos. Um, and never ever take a picture of with your with your actual license plate. I see this all the time and it drives me bananas. Never ever take a picture with your actual license plate in the photo when you take a picture of your car. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, drives me crazy. Big mistake. Um, but yeah, like just be really aware of how much you're putting out there and and try to do your best to um, limit how much data people have the ability to collect on you. Because OSINT is real. There are people who literally scan photos, looking for things and ways of how they can hack you. Um, not to be like too grim, but you, you, we remember like the rapper Pop Smoke when he passed away. It was said that they got the address for the house he was staying in off of a shipping so lease on a box that was in a picture that he posted on Instagram. Something that small, they, they took the picture, blew it up and got the address, right? So just be, for the vloggers, for the influencer community, please, please, please be aware of how much you're actually including in those photos. Like your safety and your identity is worth way more than whatever that um, company is paying you. For sure. All right. Um, well, we are coming up or we're just a little bit open um, over our three o'clock. I'll answer this one question. I'll ask this one last question and then we will wrap it up. Uh, do you recommend any open source tools? Um, I don't work with any tools. I work with humans. <laughs> That's it. Um, conversation is all I do. Is I just watch behavior and have conversations. That's it. Just watch the people. Yep. All right. Um, well, thank you, Katora. Um, it thank has been so a much. pleasure having you on yes. our Bring a Hacker to Work Day. So excited. Um, and people can get you on Twitter. It's uh, at, at Katora W, at K A T O R A H W. Okay. Awesome. All right. And uh, LinkedIn as well? Um, yes. LinkedIn.com slash Katora Williams. Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. And everybody, enjoy the rest of your day. All right.